fairness is important to me and I think it's important to a lot of people, but there's also, I think, some really compelling ways to bring people into this conversation that are that are not justice related at all in the sense of it's not like we're saying, okay, we need to sacrifice a bunch of things to make this work. Because sometimes I worry that degrowth can be framed as like a, a politics of less. It's like we just need less wealth and we need to redistribute what we have. And folks maybe don't want to get on board with that because it sounds like some sort of regression. But I like to think of it in terms of all of the positive utopian things that we can unlock if we start to treat the economy as a way to meet people's needs. Like, Maybe we don't have to work as much. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. A couple weeks ago, we were lucky enough to have Sage Lanier on the show to talk about a new way of looking at the environmental crisis and how we can approach it from a solutions-oriented place rather than a doom and gloom place. As an extension to those ideas, and as a different way to talk about our climate, our planet, and our environment, I would like to add in our economy. My guest today is Michael Mezzatesta. Michael is an economist, an entrepreneur, and an educator who has started using social media to spread his ideas for a better future. You can see his videos on Instagram and TikTok, where he explores the ideas of economics, climate, and finance, and how they all intersect. Both Sage and Michael are out here doing the work to address how to improve our lives by changing our culture. And both of them are coming up with solutions that are far different than things we would have originally considered. It's not just about things like recycling. It's about resetting our actual economy. And as someone with an economics degree from Stanford University and a passion for this work, Michael is one of the best people to talk to about this. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, economist, educator, and social media professor, Michael Mezzatesta. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Thanks for coming. I mean, I first found you on Instagram as you started your Ideas for a Better Economy series. And you caught my attention because you were basically saying that all these things that we worry about, the high cost of living, homelessness, the climate crisis, income inequality, they were all predictable consequences of the way our economy has been set up. You started talking about this new type of economics being developed that attempts to address these problems, and it's called ecological economics. And as you point out online, this isn't something that's being taught in most schools. So you took what you knew from your own economics degree from Stanford, and you started doing research yourself. So could you give us a little bit of a rundown on what you think we should know or start thinking about when it comes to ecological economics? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the great intro. It's easiest to think about it in contrast to economics the way it currently works. But I'd say, you know, the the headline is that it's a new school of economics that grounds the economy in the world, the environment. It actually says the economy is part of a broad ecosystem of the planet and life forms that live on it. And it does away with this assumption in modern economics, the the economics that is taught in most schools, that the environment is something completely separate from the economy. So if you take Econ 1A at most universities, they'll teach you about externalities and pollution in the environment is one of the things that are just like, oh yeah, that's not part of this. We're not talking about that here. That's something different from the way that businesses operate. And ecological economics has come in and said, hey, that's not a great way to run the economy. There's a lot of issues that are going to pop up. It's kind of predicted a lot of things that are happening now and said, we should actually have a holistic approach to thinking about the economy, biology, the environment, ecology. And if you actually take a synthesis of those sciences and social sciences, ecological economics is the result of folks who have have done that work and started to teach economics in a new way. Yeah, so it's different from mainstream economics because it kind of combines economics with social sciences and life sciences to kind of create something new, but also to talk about developing the economy in a sustainable way. It's about moving away from the mainstream idea that tells us that the economy always has to be growing, we always have to be doing this, and it instead focuses on designing an economy that meets people's needs, and as you say, within the limits of our planet. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, this notion of limits is really important because the way that modern economics was set up seems to believe that we can just grow, grow, grow every year, that there's no limits, and that any attempts to impose limits are actually harmful to the economy because it's going to cause a recession or it's going to cause some sort of slowdown. Our monetary system requires growth in order to, to keep the wheels turning, which is a bit scary when you think about the fact that we are running up against some of the limits of our planet's ecosystem. Ecological economics is an attempt to say, hey, let's look at the world as one system and see what an economy looks like that can survive and thrive within that ecosystem without breaking it. And it does start to prioritize some of these things like human well-being and the well-being of other species as well and treats them as actual valuable things where in traditional economics, the only thing that really has value is things that can be priced and things that can be assigned dollars. But human well-being doesn't have a price tag, so it just doesn't really get included. And so ecological economics is, is a response to all of that and is an attempt to reframe things and rethink the way that the economy should work. Right. So the economics that we've been teaching and we've been living have obviously led to an extremely powerful economy for nations like ours, but we can also see that it's been responsible for terrible things like our climate change and this absolutely gross and growing income inequality. So ecological economics is basically saying it's time we start thinking outside the box and really start considering a new economics discipline. Like we're only living within what was created, you know, a couple hundred years ago within the Industrial Revolution time. We've been living in that kind of economics, and now we've kind of hit the limit of what that can do, and maybe it's time to start thinking outside the box. Yeah, I would even say st maybe we're st we need to start thinking inside the box. You know, oh. like, we, we, we have been in a box the whole time, which is this planet we live on, and we've been pretending like we're, we're not. We have no sort of grounded system that we're living on top of, that we're building this economy on top of. And so we're starting to push up against the box. The box is starting to break. <laughs> and it's really alarming, actually, because this world we're on is what sustains life. It's what sustains our well-being, our health and happiness, it's our species and every other species. And so we need to start thinking about an economy that actually thrives within that system. And so really, I think that ecological economists and folks in this field and, you know, my teachers and the folks whose work I try to summarize in, in my videos, they've really done a lot of work in thinking through not just what are the ways that our economy can interact better with the climate and help maintain things like biodiversity and clean air, clean water, all of these things that are really helpful for life. Um, but also, human life. Yeah, human, human life. life. And we keep saying that. Like, I mean, the planet, ultimately, if we kill ourselves, you know, the planet will be fine. It's been here for a really long time. Right. It'll sort itself out. We're the ones, like, we have to start thinking of it like, you know, we need to sustain human life. Yeah, and it's all interconnected. And so this is where, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, it's a, it's a new field. And it, it is new in, in the sense of at the academic field. But the teachings that it's premised on actually go way back to a lot of indigenous cultures who had a much more holistic understanding of the world and people and our place in it as stewards of the natural environment. And so it's actually, in an interesting way, a revisiting of a lot of practices that were part of human culture for tens of thousands of years and that we really sort of lost during the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Revolution, where we started to think of ourselves as these godlike beings who could create these machines and who could build this economy that could grow and grow and grow and we could reach the stars. And, you know, some people say we we should sustain this and we should just go to Mars and keep growing, growing, and using the materials of the rest of the universe. And hey, I'm I think space travel is cool, but I don't think that we should forget where we came from and the Mother Earth that really helped us get to this point, allowed us to get to this point. And if we need to destroy our ecosystem just to maintain this economy, I think something's wrong. And I think a lot of ecological economists noticed that and said, hey, we need to actually rewrite the whole field and rethink the whole system. And so what's really great is that this new field is gaining momentum and people really seem to be excited about it. I just hope that you know, schools start teaching it more more broadly. And we're starting to see that, which is cool. I got my degree 10 years ago. Like I said, at Stanford at the time, it wasn't brought up during my curriculum. 
looking back, it's a little disappointing because it's so important. But I'm seeing more and more universities start to offer courses in ecology and economics. And you can actually get, you know, advanced degrees in this field now. And so you're starting to see it really catch on. That's great. I mean, you were recently talking about an economist named Agnes Deaton, who wrote an article Mm. that was basically acknowledging that a lot of economists who clearly have a vested interest in capitalism and how it's operating, which as you say on your channel, no duh, you know, these guys have a vested interest in things working the way they've always worked. But you point out that Deaton goes on to say that economics is struggling because economics failed to understand some of the things that we're seeing at play now, namely that they forgot to equate for power. They forgot that market efficiency divorces people often from ethics. And now we're seeing this never ending sort of wealth redistribution. And he, it kind of makes me feel like one of those people that gets to the end of their life and they're like, ooh, whoops, you know, like everything I yeah. might have said might have been wrong. It feels like Agnes Deaton might be having a little come to Jesus moment. But you want to talk me through some of his ideas about, you know, economists didn't consider power and being disconnected from ethics and just market efficiency in general and how it just makes the rich get richer? Yeah, this was a really important moment that really seemed to resonate with people when I when I shared it. This is a guy who won the Nobel Prize in economics, Angus Deaton, and he, you know, is about as well respected as an economist can be. And so typically this kind of quote unquote old guard of economics seem pretty set in their ways of thinking and this all this ecological stuff, they're like, eh, I don't know about that. Right? It's they've gotten a lot of adoration and respect for their more traditional ways of thinking. But Angus Deaton rolls around and he says, hey, you know, I'm late in life. I'm one of the, you know, prominent economists in the field. And I'm looking back at my work and the work of all of my peers and thinking, hey, we might have gotten a few things wrong. And it's really it's really powerful to see someone admit that. And yeah, what he talked about specifically, the one you said first is the importance of power. And that's a really, a really big one. It's like, okay, we can talk about market efficiency and we can use these mathematical equations to talk about how the economy is going to grow and operate and and become more effective. But we're missing this important thing called power, which is relations between humans, the way that some people have more influence over the political process and the process of technological change. Someone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos has much more influence over where technology goes and and the decisions the government makes than, you know, guy on the street, right? And we need to acknowledge that and say, hey, without an understanding of power, it's hard to understand how does inequality happen? And how does the political economy of capitalism really operate in the real world? Yeah, like if you get if you get too much power, then all of a sudden you have so much more influence. And then you use that right. influence to get more power. And it's sort of this weird circular system that we forgot to equate into our economics. What happens when people get so much wealth that that they can then affect the power structure, right? That's why we have these people buying our politicians and then having the politicians write laws to benefit them and then using their money that they got from that benefit to do it again. And it's kind of this circular loop that makes the wealthy wealthier and the poorer poorer. And we didn't equate for how much power you get when you when economics work in your benefit. And then the second one is about ethics, right? Right, yeah, he, he talked about how it's, economics has become completely disconnected from ethics, which is not how it started. Economics started in a way that was really grounded in ethics. Adam Smith, Karl Marx, the people who kind of wrote some of the seminal economics texts from the beginning of the 20th century, really we're taking it from an ethical standpoint. But in the last few decades, it's become very statistics driven, very math driven, very financially model driven. And so it's all about efficiency, numbers going up. And we've sort of failed to realize that when the stock market is going up, we're like, okay, great, the market's becoming more efficient. But we're not thinking, are people happier? Like, is life getting better for folks? And that that like, what's the point of the economy if we're not improving well-being and happiness of humans and also ideally the other species on the planet? So he's saying, look, we're doing a really good job of growing this thing, but has it become disconnected from what people actually care about? And Pete says, yeah, I think it, it has, which was a, a very, you know, 
compelling thing for him to admit. It is really compelling, especially when you think of market efficiency and how it's disconnected from ethics and then how it affects regular people, right? This is how you end up paying your workers less money or how you treat your workers or when you expect your workers to be there for how long, which has led us to the whole collection of things that have been undervalued. So, you know, we do things to grow the economy, to grow our business, to make things make more money. And then we end up with child workers or cutting down rainforests for more right. beef or sweatshops or environmental disasters or poison water, or people getting cancer from industries that are in their neighborhood. And I think that's the thing when we start talking about is it growth or is it ethics? And we can't disconnect the two. Right, right. It's like growth for what and for whom is an important question we should start asking. And is there actual upside for everyone when the, when the economy grows? And of course, you know, we get into this type of discussion and people say, oh, well, you know, are these people saying that everything that has happened in capitalism is bad? No. There's been a lot of technological progress. Medicine has come a, a long way. Lifestyle, you know, and and people's general comfort in developed economies is, has gotten better and better. So we're not saying let's just throw out all of the improvements in society over the last few hundred years, but it's like, we're getting to a point now where, and this is the, the third point that Angus brought up in his essay is when the market becomes more efficient and it grows, there's sort of a upward redistribution that's baked into that, right? Like. The, the people who own the stock of the companies that are growing and who and who own you know a lot of assets are getting most of the benefits of this growth and folks who don't have you know their their money tied up in the s p 500 aren't seeing any of the upside of all of this market efficiency and in fact things are just getting more expensive and we're seeing more inflation the cost of living is going up and folks are struggling to get by, even though they're working more and more. And so it's like, we need to think about who is all this growth for? And 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 why are we so focused on certain metrics that don't seem to reach the rest of the population? Yeah, I keep thinking about the big corporate real estate guys, you know, and how it's really in their best interest to keep insisting that people go back to the office instead of working from home, even though working from home is shown to be more efficient for the most part. I mean, people are, getting so much more out of not commuting every day about not spending money on lunch about you know being closer to their kids and it's this concept of like but this is how we've always done it but it's also like but we have all these big office spaces to fill right like we have all of our money tied up in this real estate so we need you back in these offices and you're like actually maybe we should be doing things differently we should be thinking outside the box here a little bit and people can't get their head around that because it's how we've always done it i thought it was really interesting in that that article with deaton when he was saying that like he used to think unions were bad and now he kind of thinks they're good. He used to think globalization was good, and now he's not so sure about it. So as we watch the climate worsen and inequality worsen and the rich get richer and, quite frankly, weirder, it, it becomes sort of a destructive thing, and we need to start paying attention and think about different ways of doing things. And I think that's where what we were talking about at the beginning, where ecological economics really comes in, because if we're going to talk about how interconnected this all is, I, I think that we really should talk a little bit more about the idea of degrowth, right? You made a video that reminded people of the period of time at the beginning of COVID where we were all in lockdown and we weren't going to work and we weren't shopping and we weren't driving anywhere because we didn't know what was going on and we all thought we were going to die. And in that time, the environment got measurably better. You and I both live in Los Angeles and with all the cars, we're kind of known for our terrible air quality. And all of a sudden, you could breathe better in Los Angeles, like physically breathe better. I'm someone with a lung disease, I could tell right away. And then there were all these beautiful pictures of downtown Los Angeles without the smog, you know, clear, the air was cleaner. And it wasn't just LA, right? That was everywhere in the world. Animals started to return to public spaces. There were like dolphins in the Venice Canal. And you point out that this phenomenon proved a really important point, which is that when economic growth slows, the environment improves. And I thought it was really interesting because how you made that point was that, you know, obviously that is an important thing to know when economic growth slows, environment improves, but that's not the full story. So do you want to tell us what the full story is? With Mother's Day coming up, as our sponsor OneSkin says, whether you're a biological mom, an adoptive mom, or a pet mom, 
everybody deserves healthier skin. It's not just Mother's Day, but every day. And that's why OneSkin created products that are scientifically formulated to improve your skin's health while targeting the root cause of aging. The secret is OneSkin's OS1 peptide. It's the first ingredient proven to switch off the aging cells that cause lines, wrinkles, and thinning skin. And they've got studies to back it up. I've been using their products for a while now, and I'm looking forward to trying others. There's a reason OneSkin has over 4,000 five-star reviews and was recently recognized by Fast Company as one of the most innovative brands of 2024. Founded by four PhDs dedicated to skin longevity, OneSkin proves that you don't need a complicated routine to achieve better skin. Their topical supplements make it easy to help your skin stay younger and healthier without a lot of extra steps. OneSkin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspect of aging, OneSkin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code POLITICSGIRL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with the code POLITICSGIRL. And after you purchase, when they ask you where you heard about them, please support the show and tell them that we sent you. You do so much for others. This Mother's Day, try OneSkin and maybe do something for yourself. OneSkin.co. Code politics. Today's podcast is sponsored by Sundays for Dogs. You've heard me talking about my beloved Golden Doodle Chips and his devotion to Sundays for Dogs. Sundays for Dogs is a fresh dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients. It was co-founded by a practicing veterinarian who tests and formulates every version of each recipe. Sundays contains 90% meat, 10% superfoods, and 0% synthetic nutrients or artificial ingredients. And unlike other fresh dog food, Sundays doesn't require refrigeration or preparation because of their air drying process. So you can just pour and serve. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I love my dog, but he is a picky eater with a sensitive stomach. So getting him food that he likes that's good for him has always been a production. But Sundays for dogs has been so easy. He likes the beef, he likes the chicken, his stomach seems normal and settled. It's been pretty impressive. Plus, it's easy to serve. I'm not making as much garbage with all the canned foods, and it's delivered right to my home on reoccurring order. So there's far less trips to the vet with their specialty food and their terrible, terrible parking. So if you want to try this terrific food for your dog, go to sundaysfordogs.com slash politicsgirl to get 40% off your first order. That's sundaysfordogs.com slash politicsgirl or use the code politicsgirl at checkout for 40% off. Because I know your dog is just as special to you as Chips is to me. And we know that these guys deserve the best. sundaysfordogs.com slash politicsgirl. Do you want to tell us what the full story is? Absolutely. It's undeniable and we all remember. I think that was such an important moment in human history, especially modern human history, when when the air just got cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> and there were, you know, deer walking through cities. It was incredible. And I think a lot of people really actually remember the beginning of the pandemic as a really scary time. And of course, a lot of people lost loved ones. And so I'm not saying it was all good. But I think a lot of people, friends in my community, look back and say, that was actually some of the best few months of my life. Yeah, we were calm. We were making bread. We had sourdough starters. I did like three puzzles. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. But in terms of, yeah, the full story, obviously, you know, we have to we have to look at what happened in a broader sense, too, of people who were bucketed into, quote unquote, essential workers didn't get to enjoy the peace and quiet because they still had to show up for work. They were at risk of dying from this super contagious, deadly disease. And the full story that I talked about in the video is there was an economic recession, like the stock market plummeted 25, 30 percent, depending on what country you're in. And people started to get laid off. And so typically when there's an unplanned recession like that, the folks who are most vulnerable bear the consequences. The folks who are who are frontline workers or who maybe just didn't quite make it into the essential categorization get laid off, you know, retail workers or, or people in food services. Yeah, a lot of people lost their businesses. Yep. You know, a lot of people who had worked their whole life to create something couldn't sustain it when no one was using them for that period of time. Right. Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, even though it was good for the environment, people were losing their jobs and their houses and obviously people were losing their lives. So it was good for the environment, but the rest of it was far from ideal. And I think what you're saying is it's too simplified just to say if it's good for the environment, it must be good. 
that's too simplified. It, it, it was this yeah. unplanned recession that we had, that we were not, we were shocked by this and it kind of destroyed exactly. our economy. Exactly, and that's and that's the thing that a lot of people in the school of degrowth like to talk about in terms of if we don't plan for a reduction in growth, then it's going to shock us and it's going to cause layoffs. And the people who make the decisions at the top are going to protect themselves and just lay you know lay off tens of thousands of people. But it's this notion of actually doing it intentionally and being thoughtful about okay, let's be honest with ourselves. What are the industries that are causing the environmental problems? Fast fashion, you know, certain parts of the automotive industry, excessive advertising and planned obsolescence in electronics, like these things that are actually very clearly creating environmental harm and saying, hey, what if we actually intentionally slowed those parts of the economy down through regulations or through, you know, some sort of planned transition into renewable energy jobs and this is something that is starting to happen in America and in the United States at least which is exciting the sunrise uh, movement is working on this but you know if we started to transition people from the fossil fuel industry into renewable energy then we could actually kind of plan for these certain industries to quote unquote degrow and to actually reduce their overall productivity Right, so phase them out instead of shutting them down. Exactly, exactly. And and I think the, the folks who, who are proponents of degrowth are willing to have that conversation, which in this world that economists like Angus Deaton grew up in, which is a super neoliberal, super free market, deregulated economy, it's like a non-starter. It's like, no, you can't you know plan the economy in this way. This is like some sort of Soviet communist market, uh, you know, central planning. And I think folks are folks are saying no there's there's like a goldilocks version of this that's not the government takes over but it's like let's all agree on what industries are actually harmful for the planet because if we're going to have an ecological version of the economy that actually works within the limits of our planet there are certain things that clearly need to go and maybe if we actually think about it and plan for it invest money in the transition it's possible for us to to make that happen without shocking the economy with some sort of large recession where there's millions of people being laid off. And so that's the that's the more complete story that we, we need to start talking about. And I think that that's what's really useful about the degrowth movement is those conversations are starting to happen more and more. Yeah, and it's about having the conversations, right? About asking, like, could we have the benefits of a slowed down economy, but without the human suffering? Like, if we planned for it, could we have this? And so people understand degrowth is considered social, political, and economic movement that argues that this pursuit of infinite growth that we've done in Western development is a problem because it's causing social and ecological harm. So the point is, as you say, could we keep our economic growth, but within the ecological limits of our planet? And if we could, then what industries would we have to degrow to make that happen? And it's not just about who can be making money, how can we be making money, how can we be making it faster, I grow, 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 because ultimately we've kind of hit a limit of what that's going to do and it's not going to work long term. We're going to eventually kill this box that you said we're in. We need to think within the box and be like, hey, we're blowing it here. And, and I think that's, the thing is, is I think everyone knows we're blowing it here, even the very richest people who are benefiting from it, which is why, as you said earlier, some of the very richest people in the world are looking to live off planet. Like they're, they've got yeah. this long-term off planet goal, but the rest of us are stuck here. So we kind of have to- And they're to, building bunkers. Yeah, they're building major bunkers. Like I say that all the time, like you might think the economy is working for you, Zuckerberg, but you're also building this huge bunker in Hawaii, like you know something that the rest of mm -hmm. us don't have access to, and that needs to be addressed. I mean, so if you're saying we need to stop looking at the economy as this engine of infinite growth and start looking at the economy as a way to meet people's needs, it feels like it's kind of in line with the economic justice people, right? The people who have been out here trying to make things more fair, that this concept of the haves and the have nots both in our society, but also in the world in general, which countries have and which countries have not, have only benefited certain people in this economic system. And we've left a lot of people behind and we've left a lot of people out. And the economic justice people have been saying that for a long time. And it sounds like this is another way of kind of getting in line with that. 
A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think a lot of people do think of degrowth as a form of economic justice, especially on the international scale and thinking about which countries have benefited the most from this infinite growth engine that we've set up and which countries have been left behind and how do we make sure that those countries that are still growing and still like working to lift their people out of poverty, how do we make sure that future growth benefits them and that we account for the decades, centuries really, of extraction from those countries of minerals, of resources, of labor used to be like very explicitly through slavery, but now it's in this much more sort of implicit way if we just take lithium and cobalt out of the mines of, you know, these countries that have GDP per capita that are incredibly low and that people are living in poverty and we say, hey, you know, our multinational corporations are going to go mine your, your metals so that we can make electric vehicles in the in the global north it's not quite as explicit as it used to be but it's still a form of economic colonialism and so a lot of degrowth proponents jason hickel being one of the most prominent would say yeah we need to we need to right those historical injustices by redistributing the growth to the global south the global majority and i would also say another framing for this is you know it, it, fairness is important to me and i think it's important to a lot of people but there's also i think some really compelling ways to bring people into this conversation that are that are not justice related at all in the sense of it's not like we're saying okay we need to sacrifice a bunch of things to make this work because sometimes i worry that degrowth can be framed as like a, a politics of less it's like we just need less wealth and we need to redistribute what we have and folks maybe don't want to get on board with that because it sounds like some sort of regression but i like to think of it in terms of all of the positive utopian things that we can unlock if we start to treat the economy as a way to meet people's needs like maybe we don't have to work as much you know maybe we can have cleaner water cleaner air more walkable cities better public transportation and you know actual time for like leisure and art and people can all participate in that as opposed to needing to work 70 80 100 hour weeks in crappy jobs just to save up enough money to like take a vacation every couple of years if you're lucky right like it's it's a whole shift in the way that we think about our time and uh, the value of our of our time and our leisure and i think that that is something a lot of people can start to get behind especially when everyone feels like we're on this treadmill or hamster wheel that's never going to stop spinning and so there's a, there's the justice pieces as well like we're working really really hard so that Zuckerberg can enjoy his macadamia nut fed, uh, you know, cows in, in Maui. I, I read something about this ridiculous meat that he's eating and, and cultivating out there. Good for him. Really cool. I don't know if people should have that much money. And I don't think that it's super sustainable for so much wealth to be going to so few people. So there, there, there are some, some aspects of like, okay, what is enough? And, and when, where do we draw the line? At the international level and at the personal level and at the cultural level, how do we think about, you know, why we're here and what we're doing in, in this life? And, and can we start to get the economy to kind of point towards a more happy, healthy society? Sure, and I feel like politics fits in here because totally. changing the economic system would clearly require a political shift. What are some of your ideas about how we do that? I think that we need to be honest, and, and Angus Deaton mentioned this in his essay, we need to be honest about the importance of power and the role of power in politics. The new field of political economy has done a ton to contribute to this field of, you know, how does the political system interact with the economic system and what, how do those dynamics affect the policies and laws that get passed? But I think we need to be really honest about what is the role the government should play and needs to play in, in writing this ship. And I think that, you know, in the U.S., we talk a lot about the renewable energy transition, right? The government uses mostly incentives and tax breaks to try and get corporations to make more renewable energy. But it's not working very quickly. It's not, it's not happening fast enough. Whereas you look at other models for politics and you see what's happening in China, 90% of the renewable energy growth that's happening right now is happening in China, at least in terms of the incremental change to the global forecasts that were updated this year. It looks like we're going to produce a lot more renewable energy, primarily because China's doing such a better job. And they're willing to actually step in and, and 
finance and subsidize these industries in a way that Western governments haven't been willing to do, and it's working. U.S. companies are going to do what's more profitable, and it's still just more profitable to extract fossil fuels than it is to build solar panels. There's just an economics truth to that. And so I think we need to start being willing to say, hey, these markets aren't actually going to solve all these problems themselves. We might need to steer the ship a little bit more. And I think that's at like the macroeconomic level, what the government can do. But I think there's local things too, like a big piece of what's missing, I think, from our current politics and political economy is like mutual networks of support. When we need something, we typically think, where can I buy it? As opposed to like, is there someone in my community who can who can help me meet this need? And so I hope that we can start to shift towards a version of politics and community where we're actually relying on each other more to meet needs as opposed to thinking, I'm going to pay one of these corporations for <laughs> for something, right? I think that there's just a kind of mental shift that needs to happen. And it's a cultural shift as well, away from this feeling that we have, especially in the United States, that we're never going to have enough. And I think that even the people at the very top feel inadequate sometimes. And I think that's a cultural question. And it goes back to some of that indigenous wisdom we talked about at the top of the show. of Like, what is really the point of being here? And is it to endlessly accumulate things? Or is it to be connected to our community and the earth and actually appreciate what's here and appreciate our time and, and live in the present? And I think that that is a, a cultural change. That's It's political, it's somewhat economic, but it's really like a change in our hearts and minds and spirits. And I think that that is an important element of this as well, that you can, I don't know if you would consider that politics or, or something different, but you know, what do you think? Is that is that politics or is that I don't that know. I think I, I think you're right about it needing to be a cultural shift. I think the thing is is that we've we've created this culture that's like respect the hustle, you know, and mm-hmm. maybe it's like we should be questioning the hustle. You know what I mean? I think most of us can tell you that we're not happy. That I saw a thing the other day online and the person said, I feel like I'm always saying, just let me get to the end of this week. Except I say it every week. Right? Like it just seems like mm-hmm. that all the time. And then I saw another economist talking about how we're talking so much about wealth inequality and how so many people at the top have all this, you know, accumulated wealth and power that just begets more wealth and power. I was listening to Warren Buffett even talk about it and they said, who's doing well in this economy? And he said, me, I'm doing well in this economy, people like me. And he said, but it's not like we're doing it like we used to. Like I built a factory and I'm saving money and then I build another factory and I'm kind of growing this business from my hard work. It's not like that anymore. Uh, And he said back in the day, if you were like a really successful farmer, you weren't going to be that much richer than your farmer neighbor. Like those, that dichotomy wasn't going to be the way it is. And that's not the case anymore. We seem to be headed into this new gilded age with new robber barons. And these people that are making money hand over fist while everyone else struggles. And I think most of us can see that it's not sustainable and that we don't like it and we're unhappy. And so many people are saying that out loud now that I think thinking of a new way of doing it, culturally shifting our mindset, choosing politicians that that will follow that uh, cultural shift is, you know, it is the way we probably should be thinking. And and I, I think it's unfortunate that schools aren't really teaching these ideas and these sort of critical thoughts for people to wonder if there's a different way of doing this. So if people are interested listening to us speak about this, how do you think that we change the narrative and get more people interested in trying something new and potentially something far more beneficial for humanity? How do we teach them about it when it's not in the mainstream? How would How would they know? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you're going to study economics today, check if there's an ecological economics course or if there's some ecology there. If you're going to go into social sciences at all, I think that these interdisciplinary fields that are starting to take more shape and starting to gain momentum are really where I would point you towards. And some schools are are leading the pack and some are, are behind. And I think that that's something that I would definitely look into. There's a few people who are sort of I think doing incredible work to share these ideas. I try and use social media to amplify those people. So, you know, welcome to to look at my videos for some of these summaries, but Kate Rayworth is a, she calls herself a renegade economist at Oxford who is doing some of the best work. I think she she came up with a new type of economics called donut economics, which is really a 
visualization that encapsulates the core ideas of ecological economics in a super easy to remember way. And so I would I would definitely point you toward donut economics. I mentioned Jason Hickel. He's an anthropologist actually who studies the history of how these ideas have taken shape and how capitalism ha happened, how we got here, and and how we can get ourselves into a better place. Those are two of two of the leading thinkers in this space and. There's also one last thing I'd recommend is a, a podcast called The Great Simplification by Nate Higgins. It's also a YouTube channel. Uh, he talks about the intersection of ecology, energy, climate change, economics, and culture and uh, psychology. It's just sort of the most like unified presentation of some of these ideas that I've, I've found online. And so those are, those are three thinkers and, and leaders in the space that I'd point you towards. And if I can, honestly, Michael, I would like to point people towards your work because it's all about opening our minds to new ideas and you do it in such a fast, easy to absorb way. It's about these big concept ideas that you sort of boil down to make it easy to understand and sort of start saying like, hmm, maybe I might want to know more about that. And then you have these great things like you have a bookshop attached to your Instagram that tells people like what books you would recommend if you what they want to dig more into that kind of work so tell people how they can follow what you're doing so they can go to you as a great starting point for this kind of work thanks i appreciate that yeah i'm mostly yeah. on ins instagram and tiktok what i try and do is take these big concepts and synthesize them into bite-sized educational videos where you can learn a little bit and then find resources to go deeper and I'm also keeping my eye on the news and seeing, you know, what's out there that's super relevant to, to the this evolution of thinking towards a more ecological version of our economic system and sometimes just waxing poetic about about, you know, where we're at, where we should go. So on Instagram at Michael Mez is probably the best place to find me. Um, I'm on all social networks, but that's where I kind of focus my creative work. Yeah, and it's a fabulous channel. I have to tell people, like, really go and follow Michael Mez because you learn so much so quickly about something that most of us don't know anything about. So I want to thank you so thank much you. for joining us today, Michael. I think any big societal or social change that happens in history, it starts by feeling fringy, and then it makes its way to the mainstream. And I think we have to be thinking about economics differently, not just for the planet, but as I said, for human existence, because people are not happy, they're not thriving, they're not even particularly hopeful. And I would like to see that change. And maybe by adjusting the way we look at profit and economic growth as the only success model would be a good way forward. You said in a recent post that it's easier for people to imagine the world ending than it is for them to imagine capitalism ending. And maybe we need to, you know, improve our imagination. 100%. Our imaginations are really the, the key to unlock a better future, I think. So thank you for the endorsement. And yeah, I think that the more we can do to have these conversations and point, you know, activate people's imaginations towards all the ways the world could be better and safer and more clean and, and more just enjoyable are really for the best. And so thanks for having me on. And um, I hope that, you know, folks can get something from this conversation. Me too. So that was Michael Mezzatesta, reminding us that there are ideas out there for a better economy that could benefit all of us and not just a select group at the top. That it's about considering a move away from the mainstream idea that tells us the economy always needs to be growing and instead designing an economy that actually meets people's needs and functions within the limits of our planet. I want to thank Michael for joining us today and for doing the work he does and you for caring enough about our country and planet to be here. Now go follow Michael underscore Mez online and be curious about a new and different kind of economics. Until next week, PGA. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.